you have to concentrate for a while because my story I'm going to tell you is uh, horrible uh, and uh, full of details about uh, many countries, probably some of you represent here. Uh, because right now I'm working, I'm running an investigation about neoconservative movements in the world uh, with special impact on Europe and of course Poland in it. Because you are in the country right now which is considered for um, destroying the European rights as the most important on, the li on this list. And especially in uh, women's rights and LGBT rights. And with women's rights, we had the first attack uh, right away when the ruling party, which is called Peace, which means Pravo and Spravedliwość, which is uh, law and justice, when they started in 2015, we, we uh, immediately uh, started having problems here as women. Uh, with our rights. And right now, there's a, a strong, very strong um, attack on LGBT rights. It's starting, it's the beginning, but uh, knowing Russian case, I'm quite sure it's going to develop on the similar um, model. And uh, so for the next months, you might have those news about us in Poland fighting against uh, government, which will be fighting against LGBT rights. <laughs> so uh, my story is about neoconservative movements, uh, which are not born here, but implemented quite well here. Um, in recent years, and it has to do, um, I mean, neoconservatives uh, are, since the beginning of the world, uh, there are always people who don't like to change, you know, who are less open, let's say, and so forth. But um, um, the story that's important for me, uh, and uh, the story I'm trying to tell, uh, and um, this is going to be a book, probably published in autumn, uh, is about those neoconservative to, to people which have impact on our rights right now and which started organizing uh, in certain circles some years ago. Um, in fact, I could start the story with the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, which is the change of the communist system in our bloc of Eastern European countries. And um, then we have, uh, since quite the very beginning, uh, we have lots of interest uh, by those new conservative movements to come here uh, to see what's up, and especially to Poland, which is considered and famous for being Catholic um, to our unfortunate. And uh, so they start coming here in the very, uh, beginning of the very 90s. Um, they are also trying to get into Russia because they feel this is a great market. However, it's an Orthodox church. Uh, but those people which are coming here are also not always, um, you know, of the same confession, they are uh, sometimes evangelical people, and uh, especially Americans, and um, they try to see what they can do and implement and uh, you know, change here. Mm. Uh, there are two waves and two directions they come from. Uh, one is Latin America, one is United States. Uh, both of them have their uh, let's say, branches in Europe, settled in Spain, in France, especially in, and in Italy. Um, Americans are also in other countries, um, and they are both trying to, to establish some contacts with Polish people. Um, and um, there is a certain... Um, I would try... I'm trying to make this story short for you because there's lots of details and all of them are sick. But um, to make it more simple, let's say that our story starts with two, the year 2000, more or less, uh, because this is when those groups are already settled in Poland. Uh, they are settled also in some other countries. Uh, if they are not, they try to come from Poland, for example, to Russia and to, to, to act sometimes even from Poland into Russia because they are afraid of the Russian bureaucracy, of uh, Russian corruption, so they prefer to have their offices here. Uh, but they are operating in this whole um, area. Then uh, with uh, especially the change uh, of power in Russia in 2012, which is the third turn of Putin, uh, those movements, and I'm cho choosing this date, um, because it's not a coincidence when I'm looking at those movements to see that 
many of their activities and some of them um, are open uh, this year, 2014, um, start with, with around the same time. And um, the third turn of Putin to power um, in 2012 was met with strong uh, manifestations in Moscow streets in, in many cities, but especially the capital. And the oppression um, by um, the police forces was very strong and many people ended up in jails and uh, people like us just not people who used to be activists, just people who were enraged with, with uh, the same guy coming to the power again, you know, after Medvedev, who was uh, the president for some time, while Putin was the prime minister. So he's coming back, people are not happy with it, and they are trying to protest. And uh, Putin seeing that he's losing very much um, his votes, uh, his supporters uh, is trying to invent, you know, next conflict to mobilize people around, and the best conflict is always always a war. So there is a war with Ukraine, and there is also a new war against uh, human rights. He's fed up with Western um, governments, Western politics, telling him, "Listen, you know, it's fine. You are developing Russia. No, it's fine. I mean, you know, we, we know you have corruption." And we know you have oligarchs, but let's say we somehow um, accept it. But what about human rights? And he's saying, you know, God, you know, stop talking about human rights. Human rights are not important. I'm not interested in it. Let's make business. But the, he sees that um, this um, insistence is not stopping, and he's fed up with it. So the f first attack uh, is on human rights starts with LGBT rights in 2014 and uh, what we are experiencing here and this is the very beginning because it has like I don't know the convention of our ruling party uh, in preparation for autumn elections had ha happened I think two weeks ago so it's a very fresh thing here I mean there, there used to be you know some um, anti-LGBT rhetoric before but right now it, it looks like this is the policy to in order to uh, win in the coming elections. So we'll have more of that, and since the beginning we can see that it's modeled very much on the Russian uh, case. And um, uh, also this year, 2014, um, there's a group of those, um, of some leaders of those neoconservative movements uh, who try to organize uh, in a more secret way and to meet, discuss, and mobilize. Uh, they feel that this is the moment for them um, that uh, there are many facts, uh, factors indicating that uh, they can achieve some goals they couldn't f achieve for years. So they are mobilizing very strongly and in 2014 uh, there is um, a first meeting of those which are called today Agenda Europe uh, and uh, Agenda Europe it was a document and kind of manifesto they produced but it was a secret manifesto. Mm. So uh, the whole group is called right now by journalists, uh, is, is called publicly Agenda Europe Circle or group. And uh, they first met in London in 2013, as I said, and they were meeting in Ireland, in Dublin and Munich. And uh, there was one meeting in Warsaw and um, 2016. We know it only thanks to leaks. You know, this is <laughs> secret knowledge. They didn't like it to become public. And there was um, on those papers that finally leaked, um, there was a closure that Chatham House rules, which means, you know, you don't talk about it, what happened inside. No journalists, no photos, uh, no public medias, nothing. Just we stay confidential. And... Um, Yesterday, actually, uh, because we had leaks about those meetings since 2014 up to 2015, and uh, thanks to those papers, uh, I knew that Polish organization, which is our enemy here, and uh, which name has a name, Ordo Juris, uh, became part of it in 2015. Uh, so they kind of joined this international club of people and they were present Americans, Russians, uh, Spaniards uh, with very strong organizations like Asteoir, then um, some French, Austrian and Germans. 
and maybe I forgot some Italians, Italians of course, and um, and Irish, British, yeah. Uh, so, but Poland was the first of those Eastern European countries on the list. And the next year, 2016, they organized this Agenda Europe Summit in Warsaw. And right now, yesterday, I received, I mean, <laughs> somehow by accident, uh, another leak about this meeting in Warsaw 2016. So uh, today I'm knowing more than I knew two days ago and this is how it goes, this investigation that every day something is coming to you and every day actually the story changes because there are more and more details coming up. So I can tell you the story that I know for today. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, they come from a um, certain congress that's called uh, World Congress of Families and I would like that you pay attention to that because next week they have a meeting in Verona. Verona, because this is the most conservative uh, place in Italy, this is the place where uh, Liga Nord is coming from. Uh, it's very supported by the Italian government. There are Italian representatives and politicians coming to this Congress. Uh, there was a fight in Italy in last weeks uh, because there, there are announcements about this and this guy coming and there's a pressure from the society to, to ban their um, attendance. And um, yes, it looks like they are stepping back and they don't like to at least publicly acknowledge they support them, but we are sure they are supporting them anyway, yeah. Uh, so pay attention to the news. Um, it starts on Friday and uh, ends on Sunday. Um, this is a group that started meeting in um, mid-90s and has to do with the uh, American-Russian Union. Uh, there were two sociologists uh, who met, I mean, there was one sociologist, uh, Antoli, Antony Antonov, a Russian guy from the Womanosov University, State Moscow University, who was very interested in the research of another guy, sociologist, uh, American, whose name is Alan Carlson. Today he's retired and he's not playing such an important role. Also, Antonov is a little bit away from it. Um, there's a new wave of new guys, modern guys coming, more aggressive guys coming there. And uh, so they established this collaboration first as it was like meeting every second year maybe. Now it's re they are meeting on a regular basis every year. And it was growing very much and lots of many uh, Catholic uh, progressive and many other uh, movements were joining them. So they were meeting in this large uh, as Congress large audience and Agenda Europe was a result of it and uh, need for more private conversations, more secret in fact conversations. So this is top leaders from the World Congress of Families uh, form a group of Agenda Europe. They uh, start meeting since 2013, which is exactly the year Putin comes to power and starts his new new conservative revolution in Russia. And many things that were invented in Russia, in Russian politics, against human rights, are implemented in other countries. And this is not only Poland. You can see it also in your, your countries, even if you belong to the, those most Western European countries. You have it now, or you'll have it. If you are from Germany, you'll not... You are. You start noticing this on women's rights. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I, I was there some time ago and I see it and I sense it. Um, so um, what would be good for you if you have to do with those fields uh, would be to um, read more about Agenda Europe, to see the names of people who make part of it and um, to start compromising them in your countries, pressing on them before they start doing very bad things to you. This is something I would recommend. Plus uh, organizing, um, because this is a wave that's coming everywhere. Um, at the beginning you could have a feeling that, oh yeah, you know, Eastern European countries, this is their nature to have those riots and strange, you know, guys coming to power. But this is happening everywhere and you have to be aware, whether you are German, French or whoever, that uh, this is coming to you in a way. Um, you should observe what's happening in other countries. You should learning now 
uh, the steps they are making to recognize them when they start doing the same in your country and to study what was the resistance and what was the successful resistance to their um, uh, deeds and to start implementing them uh, to, in a proactive way because we in Poland we were totally uh, surprised, taken by surprise, we didn't know what's up, we didn't understand the situation, we didn't know who was or the Yuris here? We had no idea, and now they are. Uh, even there is a strike, for example, coming in uh, public schools. So they are acting against. I mean, they are becoming more and more political. So they are acting against strikes in public schools, and they have nothing to do with the system. They have nothing to do with schools. They are about culture of law. They say this is the foundation's name and definition. So. Um, and they are under the Ministry of Culture, so uh, nothing to do with education or uh, they are, uh, of course, again, uh, vaccines and uh, they are against all this stuff. Um, what would you like to know about it? Because I, I could talk about many directions in this story, but maybe there is something that interests you. Mm -hmm. With a mic or without? Yeah. With a mic? <coughs> okay. Uh, my name is Martin from Citizens for Europe in Berlin. I have two questions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the financial sources of uh, those groups? Uh, how are they linked to, to global economic players? And second question, how are they linked to those uh, newly right-wing uh, parties in Austria, alternative for Germany, uh, um, and uh, France and Denmark, there's, there's more and more newly erected uh, right-wing parties. Uh, are they very much linked to that or are they even born out of that group? Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. One more question related to this one, that whose interest is this? You mentioned that uh, the first groups came from America and Latin, Latin America. So who's behind them? Uh, what whose interest is it so can you tell me because it's it's like a, i don't know so it's like a theory conspiracy theory if we don't know who's behind them thank you yeah this is a good point that uh, we like to think until we i mean i the crush your life that this is a conspiracy theory but you have to be uh, be aware that we are living in a moment when this conspiracy theory is becoming reality. So f forget about conspiracy. There's no conspiracy. I mean, yes, there is con conspiracy. They are conspiring against us. I mean, mm, we have only pieces of this story. Uh, and this is probably the last thing we'll learn. But uh, what we know for the moment is uh, there are some Latin American billionaires, for example, giving money to it, Mexican one uh, that I know. Then um, there are some guys from aristocracy because many of those people are monarchists, uh, people who are the most supportive for the uh, Putin's, for example, uh, family policy are also monarchists. They are thinking to make Putin Tsar. <laughs> mm, you can think it's funny, but yeah, it's funny, but they are serious about it. Uh, and. In case of Russia, um, and uh, this guy who's uh, supporting Putin with this family policy, who's uh, after Putin becoming a Tsar, is also financing Donbas and the separatists in Ukraine, fighting against Ukraine, the Russians. Um, so he's one of the oligarchs. So uh, then there are people, uh, aristocracy, as I said. Yeah. So this is Malofiev, uh, Konstantin Malofiev, uh, but he has also uh, some guys who are acting for him when it's not possible for him to, to, to act directly. So there's uh, always uh, um, a line of those links between those people. It's like in Mafia, you never know directly who's there, you know, there are, they have many faces. Um, then aristocracy, this is interesting, uh, people from the Habsburg family, Bourbon, and you know, they are thinking to restore, you know, their forgotten kingdoms. <laughs> I know it sounds sick, but, but this is how it is. And definitely, definitely we feel, and there are some indications, um, there are links between right-wing movements, uh, fascist movements, nationalist movements, and uh, those neoconservative societies. Um, this is the this is very much visible in case of Italy. 
because you have uh, Leganort, you have um, you have, there was an affair, financial affair, for example, with Luca Volonté, uh, who's a European MP. Then uh, in last weeks, in last month, uh, there was another affair. There were two journalists who followed um, representatives of Matteo Salvini, who's uh, leader of the Lega Nord, the fascist party, and at the same time, vice, uh, min prime, vice prime minister plus uh, Minister of Internal Affairs, I think. So he sent a guy representative to Moscow to talk about money. And he was followed by two journalists. Those guys uh, wrote the story about the finances that are behind uh, Leganort and um, uh, the finances and the business they make with Russians. Uh, so there was a business they made about, um, it was Gazprom involved and about some Oh, it's complicated. You can read about it online, but uh, the point is they, of course, never make it directly. So um, the deal is that uh, a certain percentage, I mean, they lower the price, Gazprom lowers the price for the Italian companies, gas companies, and with th those 3% of discount, the Lega party can use it for uh, their... Um, um, campaign for the European elections in May. So this is how they do it. Um, and there are sometimes uh, other actors, just, you know, wealthy people who support the, 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 the cause, yeah, and there are some American, uh, US, uh, pff, let's say, uh, guys who, who love the, you know, protecting human rights and unborn children, and they are very sensitive about babies, unborn babies, as they say, and so. Uh, so, in case of, um, so you can, if you study, if you study right-wing movements, at some point you'll come to uh, this connection. If you study um, those neoconservatives, at some point you'll come to the connections with uh, right-wing movements. If you start monarchic uh, movements, for example, you'll come to those connections with both. So they are interconnected, that's for sure, but in each country it, it can have different ingredients. Yeah, They can be, in some case, more linked to the uh, fascist movements, in other cases to other movements. It depends on on the context, on the internal uh, state of things. Um, in case of Poland, definitely those guys from right-wing movements, uh, they are supporting um, anti-women's rights protests, LGBT protests. Uh, you can see them um, waving with those banners, posters, holding or protecting or something, you know, their people, the, the crowd. So uh, their, their faces are on the pictures. You can see them on the streets campaigning together with them, for example, if there's anything. Um, I remember there was a case of um, protest has to do with church, something around church. And uh, they were there to protect the church or something. And, 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 and you can see this. Um, <laughs> Or uh, there was a protest at the theater Tat Povshahne in Warsaw, staging uh, a, a play by a Croatian uh, director Frilic, and which was considered by those movements as um, blasphemy. Uh, so they were um, protesting outside the theater. Uh, they were putting some gases even inside, um, and. Uh, and church people were coming too, priests and praying together with those guys, which look like football football fans. Yeah, so this is this f funny um, thing that you see them together. You see they are, you know, you feel they come from different worlds, but they are acting together today. Um, for example, uh, the leaks I received yesterday about this uh, Warsaw uh, meeting in 2016 show for those who are Polish here that. Uh, uh, Winnicki, a guy who's very well known from the right-wing movement here and who's a member of the parliament right now, um, was also attending this meeting with the neoconservatives and dining together at the table. He's a member of the parliament, yeah. He was, okay, yeah. Uh, but he's like the leader of this movement in in Poland. He's the guy who's wearing, you know, a, a chic suit, you know, he looks like a, a I mean, good student, uh, proper guy, uh, but this is how they look uh, look like today. 
And you you are you are asking about those um, when they come from. Uh, in case of Latin America, mm, uh, it has to do with uh, two very strange kind of sects. One is called El Yunque. It's Mexican. This one is somehow more dangerous because it's more secret, but also because uh, they have this uh, paramilitary aspect. And they were born, both of them were born in times of Cold War. So one is 59 and second is the year uh, 1960. So El Yunque is, yeah, I can give you the name later on, yeah? And the second is called uh, Tradition, uh, Family and Property. And it's, uh, it's a Brazilian kind of sect. Um, oh, they were funded uh, in those times of Cold War um, very much on the ground of anti-communism. So it's about religion and protection of uh, our faith and but in fact they are very much against uh, Vatican. If you know who are the Lefebvreists, so they are like them, they contest uh, Vatican decisions, uh, especially about this reform that happened in the 60s. Um, they don't agree with the changes, they don't respect popes and so. Um, and they are organizations which are not acknowledged by the church, this is very important. And we have representatives of TFP, this is the, the uh, acronym of the Brazilian one, uh, Tradition, Family and, pro and Property. Uh, we have representatives of, the, of them in all the European countries. Uh, they are in France since the 70s, they are in Spain since the 70s, uh, still you know, under Franco. Uh, they are definitely in Italy, they are in Poland, they, st they started in Croatia some time ago, they, they started in Lithuania, and I feel very strongly they are starting in, U in Ukraine right now. And uh, the second one, El Yunque, the Mexican, is more secret, and as I said, has this paramilitary aspect. Uh, they are known for many um, physical attacks and uh, sometimes killings of their oppositors in, in Mexico in the 60s. Uh, what else can I say? Um, what more would you like to know about them? If I give you the names, uh, you can read a lot about them. Yeah. You've been talking about the agenda. Oh, Samia. I'm Samia from, from France. Um, so you've been talking about the agenda and you've been highlighting two points, like destruction of women rights and LGBTQI uh, plus uh, rights. Um, can you like detail a little bit more about what they're doing, what step by step, and what is the overall agenda? Mm -hmm. So their agenda is to uh, ban abortion, that's first. Contraceptives um, to um, uh, to fight against the homo lobby, as they say. Uh, to introduce no divorce. Uh, to, if possible, if only possible, uh, to influence on public education and no sex education, of course. That. Those are the main, the main points on the list. Uh, very much on the agenda since the very beginning is change of language, the appropriating of the United Nations language. They decided, I mean, they learned, because they were known uh, in the 70s, in the 90s, uh, 80s, especially in the United States, as very aggressive and sometimes with a very terroristic face. Um, they've been attacking uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, uh, abortion clinics, doctors performing abortion, and um, some of them were killed. Uh, some of those people, of the killers, who belong to something they called Army of God, um, are in prisons. Uh, one person was released recently in November, um, I mean one of the most known. And so they realized that they are not able to achieve their goals with this aggressive face. Uh, and they started changing the language and appropriating of the United uh, Nations language and um, trying to dominate uh, public international institutions. And um, they even created a vocabulary which, um, and this you can notice in, in every country they start. 
So uh, instead of saying homosexuals, gays, uh, they like to say sodomites. Or um, they don't talk about homosexual rights, but they talk about uh, homo lobby or about um, hobby revolu uh, homo revolution, or they, I even f found a word homo gulags. Uh, and so they are very inventive. And um, um, marriages, for example, aha, no, you know, same sex marriages, of course. Uh, so same sex marriages are Sodoma. This, this is not, you know, same sex marriage, this is Sodoma. So um, this is the vocabulary they use. And there's the list, uh, you know, on the left you have what's used by the United Nations and on the right what we should use instead. Um, for example, that was also a topic of this Warsaw meeting and um, there are some record, film recordings so you can, you can hear the people talking and you can also see the screens and their presentations. So it's always there, change of language, change of language, apply different language, um, don't talk um, abstracts, uh, use human examples, um, focus on family instead of women or you know, LGBT. Focus on family and children. So don't talk about uh, homosexual rights, but talk about children who, um, who, uh, um, who experience you know, ab sexual abuse from homosexuals, of course, and so forth. Uh, so change of language is the first thing they did, and as we see, they did it quite well. I mean, of course, not speaking of embryos, but unborn babies. Yeah. This is what they do. So first of all, uh, if you like to fight back, you have to change and work. I mean, work on your language, change the language if, if it's necessary, adapt to, you know, to this new fight and refresh the human rights language. That's what we need to do everywhere. Um, it's Sarah from Germany, but uh, from Turkey. Um, how do you uh, like report on all these informations that you gather? I mean, where do you report also? Uh, whom do you inform and how? And are you afraid of being killed? Um, I, uh, I'm not a regular journalist, I'm rather an author of books, so I'm writing about it, but not very frequently. Um, there was a journalist here, uh, Tomasz Piątek, who started touching on this topic of Ordo Iuris, of this organization. And um, he later on started investigating our uh, Minister of Defense, whose name is Macierewicz, and who has very strong links with Russians, with um, very dirty stories from the Polish communist past. And um, so I somehow took it over after him. Uh, and he's much more under attack than I, mm, because he's involved in this plus, this very political issue, and many strong, you know, Russian connections that are inside there. And uh, no, no, I don't feel any, any threat from, from any side, you know, working on this, um, so far at least. Of course, uh, they are suing me after my articles, you know, I published some and they are suing me, or the Yuris, so we'll probably meet in the court. And uh, yes, they publicly sometimes talk about me as the enemy. You can see sometimes my name on Twitter or something, like they, they, are, they are denying what I'm writing. And um, uh, I started recently, I started talking publicly uh, here and actually uh, anywhere I go I talk about it <laughs> because people don't know. And it was a big surprise to me. I was in uh, Russia in January, and I was expecting to learn from them a big part of the story. And what happened was they don't know about it. And I was in the feminist circles, and I was asking, you know, do you know about this guy or that guy of this or that organization? And they were saying, no, 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 they didn't know what I'm talking about. So instead of learning from them, 
I had to tell them what's going on in their own country because they didn't know. But this is the case of a country where you know uh, public media are, are totally taken over and there is actually no independent media. Um, so um, uh, I'm tra training now how to talk about it, how to spread this knowledge with people. Uh, there's a group of international journalists who started working on that topic and we are trying to join forces and to learn from each other. This is very important, this is very, very good. And um, we are going to meet in Verona, many people, because what's going to happen in Verona is, yes, they are meeting, they are, this is very important to know that usually they meet in autumn, and in autumn last year, they had their, their congress uh, in September in Kishinev, which is Moldova. Moldova is totally under Russia, right? So uh, in last years, it was happening in all those um, countries that are very connected, strongly connected with Russia, under Russian influence. And now it's happening in Italy, only a few months later. It should happen in next September, but it's happening now because they are mobilizing before the Euro uh, elections. And um, uh, they are openly saying, no, I mean, this is, it stopped it being even a secret. Um, they're openly talking about they want to introduce their people to the European Parliament. They want to destroy the European Union from inside. So uh, they are giving money, they are supporting different organizations. And be aware that it's not that this money or um, attempts of getting, you know, putting some or achieving some Russian goals through those people. Um, is happening only through right-wing movements. Sometimes it can happen uh, through leftist movements. It depends on, on, on your context. Uh, so, for example, uh, in Spain, uh, part of Podemos, if you look at how they vote in the European Parliament, they were voting against um, uh, sanctions on Russia, economical sanctions after the Ukrainian war. Yeah? So, if you trace it, it's not only right wing, it can be both, because what they do, and which is a good strategy, they are trying to get everywhere and to create parallel uh, paths and just try to see what's the way, the best way to get what they want, yeah? I'm, I, I have to be cautious about blaming you know Russians for everything because of course we have our native <laughs> uh, geniuses and everybody's trying to ma make their own business but sometimes you can be used by somebody and in case of Poland for example which historically belonged to Russia for over a century uh, it's um, very hard to think they are not operating here However, Poland, Polish case, is so special that there is a very, very strong Russophobia in this nation. And, um, you know, any government that would have links with Russia is compromised. So everybody's trying to, you know, look like they have nothing to do with it. But, you know, it, it would be a miracle, the first miracle in the world, to learn that there's, there are no Russian operations on our grant, yeah? There are. We just don't like to talk about it because we have those phobias or, or, or there are other reasons. So, um, um, everybody's trying to make their own business right now among those uh, neoconservatives. And it's only a matter of time to see who's going to win, if they are going to win, if we are able to resist and stop them. Uh, it's only up to us, and uh, this is also very important. You know, they can corrupt everybody, if not Russians, uh, Americans, or those organizations, or aristocrats, or who knows who. Um, the only resistance, resistance can come only from us, from grassroots movements, from the people of the street. There's no other way. I don't believe, you know, in, in our governments, any governments anymore. Uh, so if we don't take it in our hands, we are lost. We are. And uh, yes, there are institutions, there are courts, high courts, European this and that, but at the end, it, it's about us. It's not, we are creating those institutions. And this is something you, you know, I'm sure, for, for very well, but um, I don't see any solution in this story. 
how to fight against them. You know, there is big money on one side. There are politicians which are or stupid, or corrupted, or naive, or just not interested, following their own career, nothing else, and ambitions. And then we defenseless, with no money, only human uh, resources. We can have thousands, we can have millions. Why not? But that, that's the only power we have. Our bodies, our brains. We can fight on the streets, we can fight you know, in the press. Um, um, writing or uh, filming or recording, you know, there, there's a task for everybody in this in this war. Ah, and this is the word. This is a war. This is one of the wars that we are experiencing war right now. So this is not a era of wars, military wars like we used to have. You know, weapons, this and that. Forget about it. Look at Ukraine and you know it very well. You can, have, you can have a war without kind of having a war, yeah? And this is also a war. <laughs> this is one of those. There are many layers of this war. But this is, in, in total, this is one war. And um, so if you are in a war, you fight as a warrior, right? So uh, don't be um, delicate, too delicate with them, too uh, polite with them. Uh, at some point, if you don't use it, you'll come to it, you'll have to start using more aggressive language to uh, protect uh, from them, because they are aggressive, and if you are not... I mean, I'm not saying aggressive in terms of uh, brutality and physical assaults or something like that, but you have to have a courage to stand, you know, face to face and uh, have a conversation whether it's a conversation in words or a body language or a street protest, you have to have this courage to stand against. And um, um, I should start with this. This is a war. This is, I, I feel it very much physically. And when it, it happened in Poland in 2016 that we had this um, attempt of introducing ban on abortion. And this is how the Polish um, women's movement, um, you know, the present women's movement started. Um, it was a very physical feeling for me, and especially because I have a daughter, teenager, um, that I felt it as a physical attack exactly as a physical attack, because this ban on abortion was uh, coming together with punishment for women, for doctors, anybody who helped in this procedure. Um, it was, um, abortion was understood also as miscarriage. So this is something that's quite, um, which is natural in for like maybe 25% of women's population uh, would be punished. That was really, uh, uh, what? <laughs> what? What you're talking about? And um, uh, I think that this fear, it was fear that uh, brought us to the street. I mean, I'm speaking of women right now. It was fear, and I say this is a war. Uh, we felt fear, and uh, sometimes you have to be very if not aggressive, uh, decided, uh, determined. Hey, uh, I'm Charlotte, I'm from France. Thank you for... France, yeah. Uh, thank you for all you said. I will check uh, in a French context if I find some people. But maybe one thing that I really make me feel a little bit uncomfortable is that um, when you're saying that um, uh, this um, secret coalition is coming from Russia or Latin America or other countries, uh, it makes me feel that it in underestimates uh, the own responsibility of uh, French, uh, for example, fascist and uh, extreme rights. And I know that uh, that uh, French extreme right is uh, very trying to get stronger and to make some link uh, at an international level. And um, no, it's just um, a thinking to um, to say that I don't think the French extreme right wait for other people to 
<laughs> to give them their shitty conservative idea. I think they already had them, and they were very strong to to build some connection with Italy, with uh, Germany, and uh, other countries. It, it was just uh, thinking. Yeah, you're right. I'm not under. I'm not trying to underestimate. I'm just uh, focusing on this in my investigation on this lobby, and this lobby includes those people coming from those Latin American sects, uh, um, uh, U.S. evangelicals. But of course, there's lots of other players are uh, at the stage. So uh, yeah, they are not the only ones, of course. And uh, in case of France, it has to do with La Manif pour tous, the, all this movement of Sentinel or something like that. Yeah. And um, uh, no, the, the, the problem is that this is only, uh, I'm focusing of, on women's rights and they are active here on, uh, on this field. And this is the strongest lobby that we have to do with today. Uh, but there's of course of other shit around, <laughs> we know it very well. And, uh, and, but they are uniting, if they see they can achieve something together beca because f by coalitions or unions or something, they be trying to, to get closer to each other. So for the moment they might be like separate you know, beings, uh, but at some point if they learn they can achieve more being together, they might do it or not. But in case of Poland, I see them uniting. Uh, definitely now in preparation for the elections, they are trying to unite and we can uh, we can notice that for sure. So um, it might differ, but uh, the tendency is, and, and they are also, they have good international uh, collaboration. So this is something we also have to develop. And yes, there, there are, you know, United Nations, they have their networks, this and that, and institutions and foundations and whatever, um, but, um, but they are somehow, if you talk to them, I don't know who are representing you in, in here, but uh, my feeling is, as a grassroots movement mm, activist, uh, that sometimes we are talking, you know, about the same, but um, like about something else. Um, it's a different experience to fight on the street and to fight as an NGO. It is a different experience. And um, of course there are uh, things that are uniting us, but in terms of measures we can apply in the fight, we are different. And uh, street people can do definitely much more than NGOs, yeah, because NGOs is officially registered, is under you know, tax uh, scrutiny and this and that. And um, it's two different entities. And, uh, but yes, we should unite like they do. I mean, everybody's trying to do it. We, we, we already know that there's no way if we don't unite. But um, as I said, everybody's trying to make their own business. So it, within those uh, unions, even if they create them, you'll have stronger people, stronger factors, stronger leaders, stronger players, and weaker ones, yeah? And it's only, uh, you never know what's going to come up from those mixtures. It may be very different in different country, but I, I recommend very much, if once you are here, to follow this uh, geopolitics, uh, to start following, because there are, there are connections, there are, um, um, they, def they are definitely applying same measures, same language, so same, the same tactics in all the places. So once you study for us, for example, Russia, you can know what's, wh what's coming to happen in Poland. Now, if you are German and you study what's happening in Poland, you can learn what's coming to you in maybe one year or two years. This is how it goes. It's a wave. It's a total like a you know, stormy ocean right now. More questions? Oh, yeah. So you said they, <coughs> they corrupt politicians uh, in different countries. Do they have other tools? For example, I'm from Hungary, and uh, everybody is surprised what happened with Orban at the end of the first decade of this, um, of this century. So he had an anti-Russia politics and communication and something really changed and it's a blackmailed or, or I, I'm curious what kind of techniques do these groups use to to find uh, partners so is it just the money or 
Do you know anything else? The problem is that uh, somehow by profession I'm a historian and I'm trying to work on this as a historian and apply all the you know, tools I, I have you know, to read text, analyze, verify and this and that, to find you know, uh, witnesses. And, and the problem is we are dealing with something that's very current, that's happening right now and I, I, I'm, you know, I don't have many things I could have as a historian. Uh, we don't have archives about what's happening right now. You know, I don't have access to internal, you know, affairs, um, papers. So there are certain fields where you can guess, uh, basing on your experience with uh, studying the history from the past. So I would say, with this experience, and uh, you know, you don't have even to be a historian. Um, that in most cases I feel it, m it could be about money, it could be they have something to compromise somebody, uh, or, you know, there are sick people with sick ambitions and they are ready to, you know, to collaborate with anybody just to achieve, you know, whatever they want for the moment. Um, so, so, so this is a very classical situation and I'm sure there's nothing very different from that. Uh, but the problem is that you don't have a way to get there unless you find, you know, an insider, unless you have good hackers, unless, you know, there is a sudden leak coming to you, or, you know, somebody who was uh, uh, part of them becomes their enemy in some moment and, you know, comes to you to, to tell you the story. But, you know, this is how we can learn. It's very like that. Um, but uh, I don't think that there's a big surprise behind. I think this is a very human thing, like an eternal, you know, human behavior. Probably in case of Orban, I, I don't know. Money, he had some good offer from this side and you have to wait some years to see your archives. <laughs> or to have good journalists, hackers to, to get there. Um, well, concerning Salvini, and I'm thinking about all those people, they do have a vision of what Europe could look like, like the vision of whiteness, Christian, religious, uh, how do they envision that and have they been talking about it and what do you know about it? Um, first of all, uh, if you notice those movements in your territory, you can be sure uh, they're anti-European even if they don't say it. So in case of Ordo Iuris, they might look you know, very European, they might look very educated, um, but they are anti-European. <laughs> And um, this is something they don't like to admit, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, I have access to proofs, to pictures from you know, uh, marches against joining the European Union in 2004 when Poland was uh, you know, voting for joining the European Union. So uh, there is a proof about all the Euris, but um, so they are anti-universal, um, let's say. They see the world as nations, ethnic nations, that's the best, uh, united by one main religion. In Europe it's basically Catholicism, the Vatican, but it doesn't have to be this. It might be, you know, they, they are fine to talk with Muslims, with anybody, you know, this is not a problem for them. And um, uh, traditional, traditional family, patriarchal, so there's the father, submissive women, um, education, because this is very important. In education, history is very important. They are creating the, their own myths, and they base the whole, you know, a strategy, national strategy, and a national feeling and identity on the history um, happenings. But of course, selected ones. <laughs> um, they are because they are nationalistic by nature. Uh, they are anti anti-whatever, it might be anti-Semitic, it might be anti-Ukrainian, it might be anti-Muslim, it might be anti-German, doesn't matter. 
But this is very strange I mean, and interesting to see that um, those nationalists are uniting internationally. <laughs> yeah? So they know and they accept. Of course, we have our nations and, you know, we don't like you maybe, but it doesn't matter because we know already that if we build a, an international front, we can, you know, achieve our national uh, goals better than without it. So this is a strange case that they are building the international, you know, uh, nationalist international or a conservative international. Um, and Moscow among them is considered as the capital of the international conservative movement. They say it. They are uh, openly praising also Putin's policy. Uh, so this is the strange thing. Um, so it's a very typical story. There is no surprise in, in it, but the only this international aspect is new, I would say, that they are not fighting against each other anymore. I mean, in the rhetoric, yes, of course, they are against other nations, usually the neighboring nations, but uh, at the same time, you know, they are building those coalitions, international coalitions. But this is something they learned, as they say, from leftist movements. Bad for us, but uh, why not? We can also learn something from them. <laughs> something more? Um, as, as this group, uh, we're all engaged in, in those issues that have, uh, that have been addressed by you, that in our engagement, we all fight all those things that those groups bring up and carry along. Um, one, qu or one plea and one question, uh, do you have any kind of reading list that would allow us to go deeper into that subject? Do you have a list of resources, of websites, of, of podcasts, of articles that allows us to get deeper into that subject? Because I believe it makes sense for us as activists active in this field to understand who are the people behind the scene and how do they work, how are they connected. Otherwise, we we stuck in our little local uh, circle and think uh, what we do at local level is important, but actually the game is played somewhere else. Yeah. So do, do you have any kind of resources that you, you could provide to us? Um, I don't know how are you organized here. But I guess it wouldn't be a problem if I, for example, collect some links, something, and provide to you. Yeah? So I, I can do it. Uh, there are certain sources, um, even there are some Polish articles translated into English. This is what we did. It's articles about women's rights, what we did as an international women's movement. Uh, we did those translations. There is a report written by a um, certain uh, European institution that's called Agenda Europe, um, restoring the natural order, because what they say is also natural order. And order, they are putting back order to the world. So those words, order, natural order, are very important for them. And um, so this report is there. It was released some months ago. Um, you can see, if you Google um, and put in the Google search certain names, you can see some articles, but what you say, yeah, uh, um, we treat them locally, and uh, this is the moment uh, those international journalists I mentioned are trying to work on unifying somehow the stories and exchanging information. So this is the next level we are coming to. Uh, so, for the moment, you don't have such a uh, one source. Uh, so th this is also why I'm working on my book, on this book, because um, I know of some academics, for example, some uh, academia people who are trying to touch on this topic. But their language is not the language that can be understood by everybody. This is something that, you know, I don't know how many, a limited number of people will read, yeah? 100, 200, that, yeah. And uh, I, my aim is to write something that would be read by everybody. I mean, at least, you know, as many as possible <laughs> in a language that's uh, available, uh, in a simple language. And language is one thing, but then 
um, I'm trying to provide stories, human stories, not because it's a very complicated uh, topic, as you see, you know, it's different countries, lots of names of many politicians and parties and history sometimes. I, I need to give some, you know, background, you know, what's the problem in this, this certain place and what are the specifics. So uh, it's complicated, especially when it's across, you know, so many uh, continents. And um, so that's what we have for the moment. We have spread articles in national languages, we have this European report, we have first steps uh, by journalists to write about the whole picture, but it's first steps. So especially after Verona you should be observing because we'll be writing about it and I know there's a team of German people also coming. Um, uh, I know at least of two teams who are coming to film it. Um, so, but, but as I said, I, I can uh, create, uh, I don't know, some open space or by emails, I don't know, however you, you exchange information uh, that you can read, yeah. And I give you the names of those organizations and list of things to read. <laughs> yeah, I saw you tired and I see you more agitated right now, I mean at least. <laughs> at least concentrated, but that's good for you. <laughs> Something more or a break? Can you tell a bit more about the, the resistance uh, and how it was formed? And I'm asking this question because also I've heard the answer, but every time you know you learn more, this is one of the very few times where I actually feel a national pride. <laughs> when I hear you talking about <laughs> um, So yeah, the resistance is there and um, uh, you can observe Verona because the, there might be something happening. <laughs> uh, so I'm now in Poland as a feminist activist uh, and after our strike in 2016 um, against the abortion uh, plans of banning abortion, um, we started kind, I started kind of looking around as I'm doing right now to see what's up because I heard, you know, of South Korea, I heard of Argentina and I have close links to Latin American countries. So I was observing what's going on, you know, of the movement Nuna Menos and I knew of certain things in Russia and I felt like, you know, it's weird. You know, I'm living in 21st century, you know, I had my life, I was busy with this and that, and suddenly I have to come to the street to protect my daughter, who's a teenager, and who's growing up in, in, in uh, worse times for women than I did in the 90s, you know. And in the 90s, in fact, we felt we are losing many rights after communism, uh, because communists had the social approach, you know, whatever bad you can say about communists, because there are bad things to say, uh, the social care was much better than we have today, yeah? I mean, in li at least in, in theory, you know, the access was for everybody. And, but in this case of women's rights, uh, contraceptives, for example, were, were funded some, in some part by the state. And I remember coming to the gynecologist each year and she saying me, um, I know, and now the prescription is, um, I mean, she was talking about money. Uh, you know, this expensive or that expensive, and and she was giving me feedback about how the system changes, and I was not very interested. Uh, I, f I felt like okay, if I have to pay five zloty more, okay, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care. But at the end today, my daughter has no refunding of anything. You know, and they are coming to ban abortion even. You know, no, come on. So uh, uh, I was very fed up and. There was already this strike movement in Poland, and I felt like, you know, we should create something international because this is international right now. I don't know why, and I don't understand, you know, where they come from, but I see, I sense that what we are experiencing here is the same that women in Argentina are experiencing, and women in South Korea are experiencing. And we, uh, when we had our strike in Poland, I saw, you know, support from so many countries. You know, sometimes, you know, 
places you don't even heard of. And it was weird because it was not only about protecting Polish rights of women, but I felt it's also about you know protecting their own rights that they feel are damaged or are coming to be. And um, so we started creating an international movement, uh, building links between I had no involvement in feminist movement before, and my friends that started building this up with me, neither. So we were totally new on this market, let's say. Uh, I didn't know any organizations, but I mean, I've, I've heard of this sometimes maybe, but I didn't pay attention to that. It was not my, you know, my field of interest at that time. Um, and, uh, so by different connections, by engaging people on different chats uh, on Facebook or using some private connections to get to somebody, um, we build a, like a kind of core of the international uh, movement. And in, we decided because of, uh, um, it was um, October 2016 uh, that we started building up this group. Um, in 2017, at the 8th of March, we chose as the date to, for the first international uh, performance, let's say. So we decided that this International Day of Women, we have to uh, change into an International Day of Fight for Women's Rights, which actually is the tradition of this day. And um, that our proposition would be striking and we imagine the whole globe striking and stopping you know work by women everywhere so you can imagine a globe turning around and at you know everywhere women are, are stopping and the world is stopping uh, so I had this vision <laughs> and uh, this is how the international women's strike was built and uh, which as i said at the first time was organized and there was lots of work to to do it and i was for several several months busy only with that but uh, next year i was too busy with what ha what what's happening on polish streets and i didn't have time to engage into this international movement but what happened was that this movement was already so formed and so active that it was happening by its own force. It didn't need more to happen. And this year, again, was the third time that was happening by, you know, because it, it's like an obvious thing today that we have to fight. There's no other way. So um, there is this um, resistance in the world. And as I see, and um, I had this fury at the beginning, and I'm happy to see that it's being confirmed, that uh, I didn't see um, a better force in the war to fight against what we started noticing here, against fascists, against xenophobia, against different anti-this and anti-that, that uh, as a, a women movement. Because women's movements and women's rights and women's issues they uh, somehow um, include all those aspects. And because this is uh, about our own bodies, and this is touching us physically like nothing else, we have a group here of um, um, activists uh, who are obywatele RP, who are co-organizers or organizers of this, um, focused on, on they are supporting us and they are fighting with us together, but they are focused, their main focus is on different issues, on uh, constitutional issues, on legal issues, um, uh, human rights issues too, but not specifically women's issues, but, and they have different attitude. And very soon in Poland we noticed that uh, when it came to protesting, they have this, um, um, how is it called? Mm peaceful forms of protesting. And very soon, we women uh, started uh, applying different forms which are not definitely peaceful. I mean, not beating anybody, yeah? not fighting with anybody, but um, different kinds of protests, not peaceful protests, shouting and walking, because we had a lot of that. And we knew that this is not leading us to anywhere. Uh, and it's time for some more of radicalism, sorry to say. Uh, I, I say sorry to say, however, I'm you know one of those leading uh, persons who started introdu introducing this uh, um, practice, and um, 
the, the issue is that you can be more effective sometimes if you are more radical. However, they love to call feminists radicals and then, you know, calling you, calling you a witch and whatever. They can call me whatever they like. Um, but... Um, this, as I said, this is a war. I don't see a different way to do it. You know, arguing with them on public TV programs, for example, you know, we don't do it anymore because they are not partners for us. They are spreading hate speech. There, there is no conversation with them. They are like robots. They have their message and they are like following, you know, only one tactic, something they learned, and, and they are not like human beings anymore. So there is no conversation, real human conversation with those guys. And um, no, I mean, uh, my uh, limit, my, my border I, I, don't, I don't like to cross is harming somebody. I don't like to harm anybody, but yes, I like to fight for my rights and I like for, to fight for your rights. And you can stop me. I'm fighting for something that's uh, human, that's uh, natural for people, that's about our dignity. Yeah? And uh, so uh, I see this um, women's movement becoming more radical and I felt it could be the only force to stop those guys. I still believe this is the movement, this is the factor or this is the, the sector of people who can do it. I really believe in that. When I look at the US case, you know, this Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, how she's behaving, what she's doing, and, and many other details are indicating that there's really a great power in this uh, women's resistance. Um, it's also bringing a different kind of discussions, uh, which are not uh, those uh, macho discussions. You know, we are somehow breaking the rules across and through. Uh, you know, so there, this is a great tool to fight against all those uh, anti-things that we have to deal with. Um, um, but, yeah, we'll see with the years. What's more, ah, uh, this is very important, and maybe let's end here. They, when they started the Agenda Europe meetings in 2013, they've uh, decided they have about 20 years to achieve their goals, yeah? So, since 2013, it's 2033, for example. Uh, for the moment, they have five years. They feel, they don't like to talk to me, but sometimes they do. And if they don't talk, they um, announce it somehow else. Um, they feel they are losing. This is very interesting, because we feel they are winning. But they feel they are losing, because they didn't achieve what they wanted. They wanted very much and they felt that ban on abortion would be an easy task. They tried, they failed. Ireland is the case, Poland is the case, Italy is the case. There's a lot of resistance. Uh, Germany now starts. And they feel they are losing. So they are starting, this is the second phase. Um, I mean, they, they started with women's rights because they felt that LGBT field is already... Um, uh, lost for them. They tried in those uh, Western countries and they felt like it didn't work. Um, so they are now trying to build like a second wave of anti-LGBT, I feel. But still they have about five, ver five of very crucial years. Those five coming years are very important. Uh, because if in 10 years they lose political support they have, and we don't know what's going to be the scene, European scene, in even, you know, a few months, so how can you know in five years? Um, they'll be over. People will be fed up. You can, you can feel, if I can speak of Polish case again, in the public um, sphere, you can see that at the beginning their aggressive language was wow, that was something new, people kind of were like fascinated with it. But today you feel people start being tired with it. It's like it doesn't work anymore so well. Um, so um, they are feeling they are losing. We are fe feeling we are losing. Uh, and I feel at the moment they are still winning somehow um, in this short distance. But in this long distance, there's no way we have to win not only because I want it, <laughs> but this is how do I see those forces. 
um, the, their language is a hate language. It can work for a short time, but people don't like to hate each other. They prefer to love each other. And if we focus on those positive things and on positive feelings uh, among people, on love instead of hate, on, the, on friendship instead of, uh, I don't know, something else, then uh, it's long distance will be winning because by nature people are not bad, yeah? People can act badly, people can become bad for some time, but at the end of times, everybody wants to, wants to have a quiet life, fine, you know, fine, fine family, and good work. That's it. I'm sorry, I became very moralistic. That's over. So we have, uh, I feel, a very important five years I had. Uh, in Poland, you mean uh, about uh, the abortion yeah? law didn't pass. So in 2016, it was a question of uh, two weeks. This new project that was proposed by Ordo Juris, which is becoming to, uh, which is a part of this uh, lobbyist uh, group that I talked about, they proposed this ban on abortion together with uh, punishment for women and for doctors, for everybody who's involved. Um, the government, uh, seeing uh, women's protest on the streets, which was called internationally black protest, uh, they stopped this uh, project in the government. Uh, and since the time we see, they are very afraid of women's protests. And right now, they are not touching women's issues until the elections. We feel they will be not, uh, because they are afraid of us. Last time, uh, last March 2017, 18. They tried again to, there was, some, there was some pressure again around abortion rights. And again, there was a big protest of women in March. Actually, actually I think it was like exactly a year ago or maybe uh, yesterday was the anniversary. And they stopped. They put it in a freezer, as we say. So those projects are somewhere circulating in the parliament, but they are frozen, put aside. They don't like to put it back on the table. Uh, so for the moment, somehow we are safe, but they are focusing instead on LGBT rights. And um, so our resistance was effective. And they are saying lots of bad things uh, about us, and uh, they call us terrorists or whatever they like, but we are effective. And the uh, main characteristic of this women's Polish movement, I would say, is effectiveness. When we have to discuss things, when we have to organize, when we have to decide, we first of all um, focus on effectiveness. What's the most effective thing we can do right now in this moment. So sometimes, yeah, yeah, there are great, you know, things you could do, but are not working for you right now. So effectiveness is the main factor. Can I just interrupt here because yeah. you're going to tell us more about uh, women's yeah. strike in the section, a session that comes before this one. So not to worry, we, you'll have a chance to learn more about it. And so I'll take this opportunity to uh, thank you, Clementina, so much for your lecture and uh, that you shared your research with, with us and your investigation. Oh, Martin, where are you? Uh. <laughs>